6640. 6640. Your future lies in 6640. 66 books by 40 authors, and yet we now discover it's an integrated message system from outside our time domain. Welcome to 6640, the ministry outreach of Koinonia House and Koinonia Institute. Today's Bible teacher is Chuck Missler, connecting the Bible to your life and the world around you. In today's study, Chuck completes his teaching on the book of Ezekiel, chapters 29 through 31. He says, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. What does that mean? No one's quite sure. But it's a very strange phrase in the Hebrew. The iron mixed with clay, he then switches to a personal pronoun. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Grammatically, what that means is that they can't be the seed of men. Or you can't mingle with the seed of men. In other words, they mingle the seed of men, which means they are something other than the seed of men. And that, ra- that leads to all kinds of conjectures. Is it possible we're dealing with Nephilim here? Possibly. Possibly. Is that what is the hint in, in Ezekiel? Don't know. I'm not one, I don't want to build any castles on conjectures here on the one hand, but I want to alert us to be alert as we go to the text, because there may be far more going on here than most people really realize. Let's go on to verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, They also that uphold Egypt shall fall, the pride of her power shall come down from the power of sin, they shall fall in it by the sword, saith the Lord God. So this is not only Israel, but all those other nations that had looked to Egypt for help, they'll all be judged together. Wow. Wow. And they shall be desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and her cities shall be in the midst of the cities that are wasted. And they shall know that I am the Lord, when I have set a fire in Egypt, and when all her helpers shall be destroyed. In that day shall messengers go forth from me in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid, and great pain shall come upon them as in the day of Egypt, for lo, it cometh. See, the whole idea of the Lord's acts here is to warn the unsuspecting Ethiopians, and the rest of the world for that matter. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He and his people with him, the terrible of the nations, shall be brought to destroy the land, and they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. Wow. He carried off by Nebuchadnezzar. He's mentioned here by name. And I will make the rivers dry. For people in Egypt, the Nile was everything. I will make the rivers dry and sell the land into the hand of the wicked, and I will make the land waste and all that is therein by the hand of strangers. I, the Lord, have spoken it. That would be a calamity. Drying the Nile is a calamity for Egypt. And uh, uh, by the hand of strangers, that's exactly what happened. Egypt fell later on to Alexander the Great. He was a Greek. And when he died, his generals took over the nations he had conquered. Cleopatra, who you associate with Egypt, was not an Egyptian, but a Greek that ruled over Egypt. So they were in the hands of strangers, and that's been their history. The dependence of the Nile is worth commenting on. Their whole lives hung on the Nile and its ability to produce sustenance by its overflowing and fertilizing the fields. Its overflowing each year was part of the ecology. And so God saying that he would make the rivers dry would be a scary threat to them. And this has happened literally in our times. The famous Aswan Dam and the disasters it has brought about ecologically. Let's talk about that in a minute. Since the Aswan Dam has been put in place, the water is no longer muddy. It's clear. It's wonderful. They've got it all under control. Sort of. Except the problem is that what the Nile always did was to bring nutrients downriver, and it provided attraction for fish in the Mediterranean. So the fishing industry of Egypt was always rich and plentiful. But now with the Aswan Dam, those nutrients don't go down there, the fishing industry is in big trouble. They're no longer rich, no longer a good harvest for fishermen. They're all starving. A nation of 40 million people now has a problem feeding itself, not the granaries of the world, as it was at one time. In the Roman period, Egypt was the source of grain for Rome. Paul, when he goes to Malta and all that, was on a granary ship. 
gets worse than that. Turns out there's some snails that attack the flax, which makes linen, and those reeds and other things that uh, upon which Egypt had been dependent for thousands of years. The snails were previously washed away by the annual flooding of the Nile. Now that it doesn't do that every year, those snails have multiplied and killed off the very crops which Egypt used to use to gain enormous economic benefit. Some people suggest the best thing they could do is blow up the dam. <laughs> anyway, these are from notes I collected many, many years ago. I'm probably way out of date, but I took these old notes to include it here just for the perspective. I'm probably way out of date ecologically. They may have solved these problems. Let's move on. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols, and I will cause their images to cease out of Noph, and there shall no more be a prince in the land of Egypt. I will put a fear in the land of Egypt. He's going to talk about eight principal cities, three in the lower and five in the upper Egypt. All singled out for all of these eight are singled out for destruction. Noph, or sometimes called Memphis in the Greek. It's uh, 10 miles south of Cairo, the home of the fire god the Epis Bull, and so forth. And I will make Pathros desolate, and will set a fire in Zoan, and will execute judgments in No. Pathros is Upper Egypt, with Thebes, or No is, is Thebes, capital. It, fa fabulous buildings, many of the ruins still remain. It's an antithesis to Zoan, or Tanis, the chief city in Lower Egypt, within the Delta. So that two of them are represent Upper and Lower Egypt, in other words. And Zoan, of course, is the Greek Tanis, the Hyksos capital of Aras, it's on the eastern delta of the Nile, west of uh, Pelusium, which was probably Goshen, by the way. And No is uh, Thebes, if you will, 400 miles south of Memphis, home of the sun god Ammon. God says, I'll pour my fury upon Sin. That's the only place it shows up here, by the way, that particular word. The strength of Egypt now will cast off the multitude of No. Uh, this is only here in Ezekiel. It's identified as Tel Faramon, which is a frontier fortress on the northeast boundary and about 23 miles southeast of Port Said. It's now completely buried in sand. It's over. It's history. And of course, Noah is Thebes again, the, the great in the upper Nile. And I will set fire in Egypt, and sin shall have great pain, and Noah shall be rent asunder, and Noah shall have distresses daily. From Pelusium, or Sin, to Thebes, is a way of speaking of Egypt from north to south. The whole enchilada, as we might put it. Okay. And these cities have now disappeared altogether. The young men of Avon and Pephesus will shall fall by the sword, and these cities shall go into captivity. Avon is Heliopolis in the Greek. The present Tel Hassan, or Sun Fountain, if you will, located about seven miles northeast of Cairo. The seat of the sun god Ra. And it was also the home of Joseph's father-in-law, incidentally, in Genesis 41. Pibiseth is present-day Telbasta, about 30 miles north, northeast of Cairo, house of the goddess Bas, to whom the cat was sacred. Okay. I'm always, whenever I think of cats, I'm always reminded when my daughter, my oldest daughter, was very young. She came up to me and said, Daddy, are there going to be animals in heaven? It must be horses, because he rides a horse coming back. I said, of course there's animals in heaven, huh? We know there's cats in heaven. Where else would they get the strings for the harps, you know? She almost hit me. It came close. <laughs> Moving on. At Tehaphanes, also the day shall be darkened, and I shall break there the yokes of Egypt. The pomp of her strength shall cease in her. As for her, a cloud shall cover her, and her daughter shall go into captivity. Tehaphanes, which is uh, pronounced several different ways, Daphne of the Greek, it's on the Pelusia bank of the Nile on the eastern frontier fortress, about 30 miles southwest of Pelusium. It was Pharaoh's residence. You're dealing in royalty down there. Thus will I execute judgments in Egypt, and they shall know that I am the Lord. There is that phrase that occurs maybe more. I count 54 times in the book of Ezekiel. But let's continue chapter 30, the next part, next the fourth of the seven. The arms of Egypt shall be broken by the arms of the king of Babylon. It came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first month, on the seventh day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, now we're in about March or April of 586, three months after the, where we started, if you will, four months before the fall of Jerusalem. Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed, to put a roller to bind it, to make it strong to hold a sword. See, in the first, in verses 21, 22, and 23, the Lord is this destroyer of Pharaoh. 
it's going to shift a little bit from verses 24, 25, and 26, where the king of Babylon is the agent of the Lord in hurting Pharaoh. Broken the arm of Pharaoh. And that's probably a reference to the recent defeat of Pharaoh Necho, if you will, the preceding Pharaoh. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and will break his arm strong, that which was broken, and I will cause the sword to fall out of his hand, and I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations, and will disperse them through the countries. Scatter the Egyptians. That refers to the army that still remains in Egypt for defense, and the rest of them that were defeated and fleeing, if you will. And I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand, but I will break the Pharaoh's arms and he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. But I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall stretch it out upon the land of Egypt. So Babylon's going to conquer Egypt and Pharaoh would be powerless to stop it. All of this was literally fulfilled. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the countries, and they shall know that I am the Lord. There's that phrase again. Okay, we're in chapter 31. Now this is a lament for the fall of Pharaoh. It came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, and the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to his multitude, whom art thou like in thy greatness? That's a question. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. In other words, this is equivalent to saying God saying, Thou art like a mighty, the haughty king of Assyria, as he was overthrown by the Chaldeans, so shalt thou be the same. He's drawing a parallel here with the Assyrians. Now, the Assyrians got, you know, in Israel's perception, was wiped out. So there's an analogy here, except this whole term of Assyrian may be much deeper than most commentators are aware of, because we know from a passage in Isaiah that the Pharaoh of the Exodus was not an Egyptian. He was an Assyrian, according to Isaiah. The first world dictator was, in effect, an Assyrian, Nimrod. The Pharaoh that was, in the, as I say, in the, of the Exodus apparently was Assyrian, an Assyrian. So the term Assyrian here may be used to, uh, in an allusion to a parallel to Israel because that the northern kingdom got wiped out and so forth. It may be something deeper than that because we also know from Micah 5 and Isaiah 10 and a couple of other passages that the Antichrist will be an Assyrian. It doesn't come out of Western Europe. That's, that's from a misunderstanding about Daniel 9.27. Because we know that the, the people of the princes shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, who destroyed the city and sanctuary? The Roman legions. Yes, but the Roman legions were not Italian. They were auxiliaries recruited from Assyria, by the way. And Syria and Assyria. Anyway, there's a whole study there. I encourage you to keep your mind open and, and do your homework and see what you think. But anyway, behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. There's drawing a, a, we're going to talk about trees here. We're shifting another kind of allegory here. A cedar in Lebanon with fair branches, with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running around about his plants and set out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied, and his branches came long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. It's talking about this Assyrian as if he's a tree, and how he's bigger and better than all the rest. But it's drawing an analogy, right? All the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. That sounds pretty cool unless you've done your homework in Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, the fowls of the air nest in the branches of the mustard plant which had grown unnaturally into a monstrosity large enough to support them. The birds there, at least, are identified as the ministers of Satan. Now, if you believe, if you want to apply, and maybe this isn't the proper place, but if you're going to apply what they call the principle of expositional constancy, that is, the tendency of the Holy Spirit to use an idiom consistently, then maybe these fowls of heaven are more than just birds that happen to lodge in this branch. Maybe there's something more sinister in view here. That's something that requires some prayerful study. 
Thus was he fair in his greatness and in the length of his branches and his root was by great waters and the cedars of the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs and the chestnut trees were not like his branches nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. That language bother you? Did that echo a little bit the kind of language that was used of the king of Tyre when it was talking about Satan? You're seeing the same kind of tone here. That doesn't mean they're equivalent. But just be alert to that as we go on here. I have, God says, I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Wow. That might be just a figure of speech or it may be a re revelation of something a little deeper. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, and he hath shot up his atop among the thick boughs, and his heart was lifted up in his height, I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen, and he shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. God speaking. And strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off, have left him, and upon the mountains and in the valleys of his branches are fallen, and his boughs are broken by all the rivers of the land, and all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. Who? All the peoples of the earth? This language is rather broad gauge here. There's a subtle tone occurring here that's analogous, if you will, to Ezekiel 28. That's where we had all that business about Satan in there, right? Where God clearly reaches through the king of Tyre and those idioms to speak of Satan. There are hints of that same kind of thing here, but not quite as strong. It's not as crisp, not as clear. You may recall in Daniel 10... It's another one of these strange glimpses where we get a glimpse of that spirit world. It's behind. We, we understand that behind the powers that we see in the world are demon hosts. In Daniel 10, you have a glimpse of that, an angelic messenger, and this bizarre supernatural conflict that's going on invisibly behind the powers. There it was Persia and Greece as the two powers and so forth. Daniel 10, the whole study, if you will. So that same perspective seems to be hinted at behind these passages having to do with the Pharaoh of Egypt. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain, and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches, to the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height, all that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death, to the nether parts of the earth in the midst of the children of men, with them that go down to the pit. My goodness, what's going on here? We're going to go into Sheol before this whole passage is over. Wow. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. I covered the deep for him. I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed. And I caused Lebanon which is an idiom for cedars anyway, but it can, to mourn for him. And all the trees of the field fainted for him. Strange mix of language here. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to Sheol. Hell in your English Bible, but the word in Hebrew is the Sheol, which isn't the grave. There's a difference between the abode of the dead and a grave. A grave has title, it's physical, it's where the body is. Sheol is a Hebrew term. that it, it, It's analogous to what we say in the Greek, Hades. Not Gehenna, Hades. Hades and Sheol, for our purposes, are essentially synonyms. But it's not just a grave that you have a marker and have a, someone owns a grave. No, no. It's the netherworld. Okay? Cast them down to Sheol with them that descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden and the choice and best of Lebanon and all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. What does that mean? I have no idea. They also went down into Sheol with him unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. To whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shalt thou be brought down to the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth, Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh in all his multitude, saith the Lord God. Now, is that Pharaoh of Egypt? Or is that language intended to be used more connotatively? Don't know. No, no. 
I haven't found any scholars that really deal with it, except in a translational sense. Nebuchadnezzar gives his testimony, unrelated to this directly, but very profound, because Nebuchadnezzar wrote a chapter in the Bible, Daniel chapter 4. All the nations in this passage here were symbolized or characterized by trees as a, as a figure of speech. In Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar had a vision of a great tree, and through that it reflected his own pride that caused his downfall. And Nebuchadnezzar himself points out that it was due to his own pride that his kingdom was taken away for seven years. For seven years he's treated as a, an asylum patient. And we understand from uh, Jewish records that it was Daniel that took care of him during those seven years. So not only did all this kind of thing happen to Nebuchadnezzar, but he wrote how he came out of that and repented of it, and he posted his testimony throughout the known world. And it's all in Daniel chapter 4. He wrote that chapter. Okay, we have seven oracles, I said, against Egypt, right? We had the first one in the first 16 verses of chapter 29. The second one was the rest of chapter 29. The third one was the first part of chapter 30. And the fourth one was the next part of chapter 30. Then we had the fifth one, which was the first part of chapter 31. In fact, the whole chapter 31. So we have five out of seven that we've talked about this evening. You with me so far? I've done this sort of deliberately to get most of this behind us in order what we're going to try to put it all in perspective next time. If I tried to do it for this time, it would have run too, a little too long. We have number six, a lament over Pharaoh, the crocodile of Egypt destroyed by the king of Babylon, and then a dirge sung at the descent of Egypt into the underworld. And what's weird about that are they people they meet there. And we're going to talk about that next time, because these two remaining ones will finish our review of this major section. There are three major sections to, to the, the book of Ezekiel. First one was Judgment in Jerusalem. We took all that. These five chapters, 25 through 32, of the heathen. This major section we'll finish next time to prepare us for the good stuff, so to speak. The upbeat stuff. Okay. So in the next session, I want you to review the chapters we just read. And, and you might just mark the passages that seem to have a double entendre, a double meanings maybe. And then study carefully chapter 32, and we're going to use the occasion next time to review not just 32, but the whole package. And for example, you'll discover that the nations that are here enlisted have some interesting things in common. They are all Muslim nations. And you're going to discover Islam has its roots long before Muhammad. It's the worship of the moon god. And we'll, take, we'll go in the scripture and see what's said about that. And we'll try to put this in perspective, a perspective that may transcend the picture that we have here. Because we've got another little problem. Each one of those ancient tribes, Edom, Moab, they don't exist anymore. They've disappeared. No one can trace themselves really to those. So what is, is it talking about just geographically? Or are those nations going to reemerge? Ooh. Because they apparently have a judgment that yet is unfulfilled. So we're going to talk about that next time, try to sort out that. What nations are also involved? When does all this happen? Are these prophecies that Ezekiel made that were fulfilled back centuries ago? And what does Islam have to do with any of this? Islam has everything to do with all of this. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. The Word of God. It's interesting that the Creator of the universe has given us His Word. It's interesting to sample the richness of these revelations on the one hand, and yet we can't help but do this in a way that sharpens our sensitivity to there being far more here than meets the eye. We're not going to try to promote any particular perspectives. We're going to just try to sharpen our sensitivity to the possibilities and see what God has to do. Because we are moving into chapters in the Bible that apparently are on our immediate horizon. So trying to put this all in perspective is the challenge. So your teacher is not Chuck Missler. Your teacher is the Holy Spirit. And we try very hard to adopt what we call a heuristic method. 
Heuristic teaching is serving for the student to discover for himself. Give you the tools, the sensitivities, but the challenge is for you to do your own digging and avail yourself of the resources that are available right there in the Word of God. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your Word. We thank you that you've chosen to bring us to this very point in time. So, Father, we would seek your Holy Spirit to guide us, to illuminate not just these passages, Father, but for the very path that's now in front of us, that we might be more responsive to your will in our lives, that we might be more effective stewards of these opportunities. Father, we do pray for ourselves, for enlightenment and discernment and wisdom and resolve. We also pray for our leaders who face such difficult decisions. We pray that your spirit would overrule, that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives. As we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservations whatsoever, we commit ourselves in your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, our coming King. Amen. You've been listening to 6640, the ministry outreach of Koinonia House and Koinonia Institute. Today's Bible teacher was Chuck Missler, teaching through the book of Ezekiel. Download the new K-House TV app to access an ever-growing collection of free resources. Visit the Apple or Android app store or search K-House TV on your Roku or Fire TV streaming device. Thank you for listening to 6640 and for your continued prayerful support of this ministry. Until next time, as we continue this series, may God bless you with the knowledge of His Son, Jesus Christ, as you study His Word.